So who here has done deep learning? Not too many. That's pretty new. Andrew Eng said that he's actually one of the founders of deep learning. He said that anything a human can do in one second, deep learning can do, or machines can do now. So it's pretty scary, right? But it's also good, because there will be a lot of good change coming in the next few decades. And I'll give you a little introduction of what deep learning is and how it stands and what it can do, what it cannot do. And you have to understand that deep learning is just one particular version of a machine learning algorithm, which is part of the artificial intelligence space, which is also just part of computer science. It's all just technical stuff. Uh, deep learning itself is basically a bunch of numbers going in, a bunch of numbers coming out. And it's just a transformation of these numbers. That's why TensorFlow is called what it is. It's just a bunch of numbers going in, being transformed. And the transformations are very simple, right? You just multiply numbers. You see, if you're a neuron, you get some inputs. You sum them up. You get a number. You transform that number with some activation function, and you create an output similar to what your neurons are doing in your brain, but it's just loosely adapted to your brain. Your brain actually doesn't quite work like that, but this was good enough a model that it worked, and it's been working quite astonishingly in the, in the past decade or so. And you can make a model from a like, bunch of numbers, like heartbeat or oxygen levels, and you can predict whether that person is going to the emergency room or not, right? And that can actually beat doctors. But what is actually AI? Well, it was, it was coined 60 years ago, over 60 years ago, by this gentleman. And he basically said, hmm, somehow I feel that we can do something. I feel that in just a few, in a few weeks, maybe two months, a few people, maybe 10 people can sit together and just literally do this, right? We can just simulate the way this intelligence works and just program it up. Fortunately, it took a little longer than a summer. But we're almost there. So you can play chess now, which almost um, nobody believed 20 years ago. A machine can beat a, the best chess player. And that was done with brute force, right? You had uh, a bunch of CPUs. You brute forced every possible combination of a move. And you computed the one that was most likely to end up with the best uh, outcome. And you can think many steps ahead. And if you have a fast enough computer, you can do it. So now you say, oh, yeah, that's obvious. Of course, you can compute all the states and just figure out what's the best. Well, would you have thought that something can drive a car in a city with rain and people crossing the streets and bicycles left and right and chickens running across the street? Well, even that's possible. Stanford pioneered it here uh, a little bit over 10 years ago. They, they had a car that drove itself uh, for 130 miles. That actually was the lab that McCarthy uh, invented or established, I should say. This, this was done not so much with uh, deep learning yet, but more like a bunch of sensors, a bunch of models that somehow transformed, uh, transformed that analog signal from the cameras, figured out some patterns in it, uh, physical devices that trans like Fourier transformed hardware filters and so on. So you, you just had a bunch of engineers basically put that stuff together and make up rules there's some high object in the way, then go around it, basically. And yeah, it was a step closer. Driving a car is pretty impressive. Now, Jeopardy was um, beaten by IBM Watson 2011. It actually could outperform humans at answering arbitrary questions. And I encourage you to watch this video. It's pretty impressive what these two gentlemen were doing. They literally answered every question immediately but not quite as immediately as uh, the computer could because the computer got the question as a text input and it actually had to physically press a button with like some magnet bolt and that was done so fast that the humans basically couldn't press the button fast enough because it took only milliseconds to compute the best answer from a bunch of in-memory Hadoop nodes if you want, something like that. It was, a, it was a cluster, 90 servers, they had all the text of the world in memory, and they just went through it with a bunch of hand-coded rules, and they figured out what's the most likely answer for this, right? Just brute force again, but this was kind of the um, showcase that in-memory processing is a good idea. So then Google came along with a bunch of startups it acquired and translated text in real time. You can even speak to your 
Chinese cousin that you've never met um, over the phone, and you speak English, and he uh, speaks English, and it translates for you. It's pretty amazing, right? It's all in real time, um, all done, and that's deep learning now. So at this point, we're using deep learning for this technology, and it just crunches numbers so fast. It does 1D Fourier transforms over your voice signals. It figures out what word you said, what um, the most likely thing is that you just said, and then it somehow translates that, figures out the meaning of those words, what you meant to say, selects the right answers, and so on. And that was, of course, done with a lot of data, because text is, is available, and people's voices is also available. So if you have data, you can do a lot of things. Now, video gaming was also possible. So you have actually robots that play video games for you, and they never were told or programmed to do that. They were just programmed to learn how to do that, right? That's the power of deep learning. It just looks at the pixels, it says, um, do something, and that didn't work, okay, do something else. And then, based on where the ball is on that screen, if I press the right or left key as a computer, I get rewarded or not. And by doing this 100 million times or a billion times, I kind of figured out what works. It's just brute force, but it actually works. And Go had a lot of different states, right? This board is a pretty big board. It's 19 square. You have a bunch of uh, white and black stones. And there's trillions and trillions of, of combinations, actually more than square the number of atoms in the universe, combinations, and somehow Google DeepMind was able to program a deep learning model together with some reinforcement learning and tree search, Monte Carlo simulation, all kinds of stuff, to brute force that better than the best human. Now, that doesn't sound that bad anymore, right? It's, you just have to be better than the best human. It doesn't mean that they actually solved like, every possible state and figured out the probabilities for each. No, they just had to somehow find more possibilities than a, a human. And suddenly, the human's capabilities are not that great anymore. We have to just realize that and focus on what we like doing. So we can all go enjoy ourselves a little bit more in the next decades, because we don't have to do the gardening or the, the hard uh, work that the farmers were doing 100 years ago, when 98% of people were actually involved in agriculture. Now, they would have said back then, well, if you don't all have to work like us anymore, then just go enjoy yourself, right? Why are you all sitting here, uh, studying hard, sitting on a desk all day? But people start doing something else. They, they don't have to dig up the, the beets anymore in the garden. They just start doing something else. And hopefully, you all can do something fun in the future that's not something that can be automated easily. So all the repetitive tasks will go away. And businesses, of course, will, will use these powerful machines to make decisions for them. And data is valuable. In the past, if you had data and some, some person who knew the math, you had already an advantage, right? You had some kind of desktop station, workstation somewhere. You had some model. Uh, maybe you had the better model than someone else. That was, was good to have. Now, if you don't have data, you don't have models, you're lost. Your company will go out of business in no time. So, and you have to think ahead. What kind of data can I collect today to make a better model tomorrow? What do I need? What could I have done with the data? How do I curate it? How do I build models with it? How do I know what's wrong with the data, which features to collect or to create? So deep learning really helps with this, because it is a model that's simple enough that you can understand it, except that it's not really that understandable. But you, people basically can play with it and see how it works. And it solves many problems. It's very powerful. It learns from big data. You can throw a terabyte at it, and the model just gets better, because the model itself has billions and billions of parameters. It just learns them. And it is better than humans. It can already translate text as well as humans from any language or any other language. It can see better than humans. It can classify stuff in real time. It will drive your car. It will do a lot of the work that people had to do. I look forward to not having to drive for an hour and a half every day. And instead, I can read something or uh, listen to something, right? So the downsides of deep learning are the interpretability. But there's new uh, inventions that came out of machine learning that, that tell you, like, these are the reasons that the model made that choice. 
And if you had different inputs, the outputs would have been different in this and this way. So there will be ways around the interpretability problem. Nobody can interpret the billion numbers that multiply each other up to that output, but you might not have to. You don't understand everything either about the universe. You don't know why this is reflective or not, right? But it just kind of is. And the same thing will be true for these models. You just have to put guardrails around and have statisticians tell you um, the outcome is so and so likely or not. We have to put more around it than just the prediction itself. You have to give a confidence interval, some kind of sampling estimates, and so on. Um, you might have seen deep learning models. If not, I'll show you some more. But they can be very complicated. They can be hundreds of layers deep, and building blocks that are not easy to understand. And you just have to have somebody who got lucky that tells the world how it, they did that, and then everybody else benefits from it. So that's a way to learn. And the parameters are very complex. Um, the configuration, right? You can say how many layers, how wide the layers should be, the learning rates, and all details like that. But eventually, some machine will help you automate that as well. And the speed can be taken care of with good hardware. And the, the rapid pace of innovation in that space is a good thing. But we are helping to make that easier for you. So H2O already has been a pioneer in deep learning in the last three, four years. I was fortunate enough to work with H2O on deep learning. And we, we had a clicky interface, not just R and Python, but actually you can click it with a mouse and almost have to type nothing. You can build complex deep learning models on a cluster, on Spark. Um, that, that predict um, from arbitrary data sets, except for images, just for like regular structured data sets with categoricals, numbers, everything. doesn't have to be standardized. You don't have to do any one-hot encoding or a vectorization. You just dump your CSV. You can predict any column from it in a distributed environment. So that, that's what H2O was doing. But it was basically just like a GBM or a random forest or a logistic regression, just another model. And that's the beauty of H2O. It basically brought this to the market in open source for everybody to use. And the world liked it. We were as popular as TensorFlow in a recent poll by KD Nuggets. And uh, you could say it's all good. But no, we don't want to stop here. We want to bring it to the next level, which is these uh, networks on the right side. right? So before, it was a bunch of layers fully connected, the similar to that image I showed in the beginning. You just had. Uh, fully connected neurons. Every one was connected to the next layer. Now you have networks that are almost arbitrary. They just connect some number here, goes to some other number as an input. And they just um, can almost do anything you want. You can program these building blocks to renormalize themselves, to do some pooling, where you take the maximum value of a bunch of numbers. You can do convolutions. It's like a Fourier transform, like a lens, like a physical lens that acts like an eye. So you can actually see better. And you can then uh, segment pixels. Every single pixel can have a probability of belonging to a certain class. You can say, is this cancer cell or not, for example? And you get like a coloring of the, the image based on the probability of being cancer or not. And all that stuff you can do with these complicated graphs. And H2O Deep Water, that's the name of this project. It's basically a, a, uh, a new platform that allows you to use these GPU tools. GPUs are graphic processing units, the same as a gamer card in your computer, that makes um, not just graphics fast, but all kinds of dense linear algebra, like multiplying numbers over and over again. And these GPUs that cost a few hundred dollars are actually up to 100 times faster than a regular processor for this kind of dense multiplication of numbers. Where you do nothing else but multiply millions and millions of numbers. And H2O will make it easy. You will have TensorFlow, Cafe, um, MXNet, different models that someone else in the world trained, some PhD published on GitHub. You can just take it and run it against the cluster of H2O in Spark from R, from Python, on your Jupyter notebook from RStudio, and it'll just, it'll just run. You don't have to worry about how to compile from source the light, latest version of TensorFlow or the CUDA or whatever. Everything will be shipped in one, in one uh, jar, one file that you have to download, and that's it. 
And you can, of course, then solve all these problems that have to do with these data sets that are much more complex than just 10 or 100 columns. You now have millions of pixels as an input for every single picture. The images don't have to be the same size. Everything will be taken care of, of um, for you. And, and you can really do cool stuff, right? The upper bound is your imagination. You don't even need to know um, what you can do. You can just wait for somebody on the internet to post another solution to how to do NLP or how to do um, some sort of um, smart, like whatever time series with recurrent neural nets and neural nets that have memory in them so that they can remember the past and then learn about sequences. And these models are very powerful. So the way we do this is we, we add something in addition to the yellow boxes. H2O so far was only the yellow boxes, which was a cluster of Java software. Each machine had some Java instance running, and they talked to each other, and they collectively build a model after they parse some data. The data was parsed from Hadoop or Spark, like some cluster that has storage, or from a plain CSV, or downloaded from the internet, or from Parquet, some files, some whatever, Excel, some, some source, right? You suck the data in. The data can be 100 gigabytes or more. It parallel um, ingests this data set into the cluster at a pace that's really fast. You will actually be surprised how fast we can ingest data, much faster than data.table, for example, for the experts here. Um, this is the fastest ingest of data. And then when it's in the, in the cluster, it actually compresses the data in a lossless compression. So you don't actually need as much space as the file uses on disk. And when it's distributed, you can add more machines to parse bigger data sets. So let's say you have a 20 node cluster up. You have 5% of the data on each node. And then you can instruct that cluster to run an algorithm from your R script or your Python script. That's on your laptop. So on your laptop, you say, hey, load this data set. The cluster goes and pulls it from that source. Then you type, OK, now build a gradient boosting model. And all that Python does is creates a string that says, hey, cluster, please start this model. And that string gets sent over the wire to the cluster, to one of the nodes on the cluster. That one node says, hey, guys, we need to do this job, tells it to all the other 19. They built this model in parallel. That's what the yellow stuff stands for. And that's alone very powerful, but it doesn't have a GPU because GPUs and Java, it's, there's no real support for that. So what you have to do to get GPUs to work, these graphic cards, is you have to add C++ code that talks natively to that device over the PCI Express bus on your servers. And Amazon actually made a, a new version of, an, of a server node that has 16 of these graphic cards in them. So there's really beefy boxes costs something like $12 an hour, if I'm not mistaken. So it's not cheap, but it actually is very powerful, right? There's, there's like something like 200 teraflops of compute power in there. And the C++ code, that can then talk to the graphic card or to your CPU. You can still run on a CPU. It's just going to be slow. But at least you can like do scoring, for example. So you can build a really good model on your hundreds of terabytes of images that detects whether your damaged car is totaled or just scratched. And then you can deploy that model on a CPU on a Hadoop cluster to, to score 100 million observations in a few seconds, right? So for example, you go to the internet, you Google like best image classifier, you'll find this paper here that just came out in August where the recent years of Google research that led to the inception model it's called Inception. And the recent years of Microsoft research that led to the ResNet, residual net model, they were combining those two, and they built the Inception ResNet model. So even those giants are working together now by virtue of being open sourced. There's no other choice. They basically come up with a model. Sorry, this is not as sharp as it looks in the original. So there's basically something like 200 layers, and there's building blocks that are repeated. So you first you have 10 building blocks like this, this pink one here, then you have 20 building blocks like that, and another 10 like that. So the whole thing is something like 40 of these building blocks in sequence, and each building block just happens to be good at taking some numbers and turning them into some other numbers. And what it really does is it mimics the eye 
uh, the physics of an eye, as I said earlier, the Fourier transform, convolutions. For those who are scient scientists, it's basically transforming your, the, the image into some kind of spectral image. But it just knows, is it, are there like patterns like this or like this? Or is there a transition from red to blue? Or is there some curve like this in there that's, that's uh, like an edge that, that, that looks like it's, it's a transition in shape? Um, it basically detects these things. And the first layer just looks at raw edges and corners. And the second layer says, well, if I see a red patch and a blue patch, then that signal gets activated. So there's some neurons in there that get activated that have a high number that goes out of them if there is a cat that has stripes, for example. And there's one neuron that detects stripes like this, and the other neuron detects stripes like this, right? Different directions. And you just brute force these pattern detectors, and in the end you have like a signal that says, yep, I saw enough stripes to think this is a tiger, or I saw smaller stripes, so I think it's a, a kitty cat, and so on. So it's, it's really about that. It's just brute forcing those shapes. And these models, you can really look at them as source code, as Sri said earlier, everything is source code nowadays. You can download this model. You can just copy paste it, which is literally what I did. And I copy that into our Jupyter notebooks. First, I import a file that has a bunch of JPEGs, path to JPEG files, and labels, whether it's a cat or dog or mouse. And then the next block just says, OK, please build me a model. And the model that I want to build was created from the script that you just saw that I downloaded from this ResNet Inception hybrid model that someone posted on GitHub. So we just point to that file. We say, please build me a model. And seconds later, you have a model that you can actually inspect in our graphical user interface called Flow, which is even more than a Jupyter notebook. It's actually an interactive notebook where you can write code, and, and there's something that comes back, and you can inspect that graphically. So there's real-time updating uh, charts, and, and you can see the progress of your model in real time. So you don't have to wait until the progress bar is all the way at 100%. You can go to Flow and inspect the model as it's training. You can see that it's converging or not. You can see the speed of training, how long it's going to take, and all that. And later today, for those who are interested, we have about 100 um, EC2 instances on Amazon running right now with graphic cards and this Jupyter notebook already. So you'll get a piece of paper at 3 PM today that has an IP address. You just type that in, and you'll, you'll be connected to something like this, where you can actually build these models. And we'll walk you through that for one hour. So that's at 3 PM. And those of you who've never built a deep learning model but would like to know what that feels like, uh, you're welcome to join us. I'm not sure whether it's going to be here or on the other side, but it's going to be at 3 PM. Is it, is it going to be the other side? OK, the breakout room. So that's at 3 PM. And obviously, if you have a model, you can compare models right? with Steam. That's our latest product. You can compare them. You can see which one is um, performing well on a test set. You can then deploy those models with a click, because everything is Java is source code. It's, the, the, the model itself is just data. It's a bunch of numbers. You can just take that bundle of numbers and just deploy it, and then score against it on a GPU or a CPU in your scoring environment. And you can just ask, hey, what's this image? Is this a dog? Well, of course it is, but what kind of dog? Right? These models actually tell you it's an Entlebucher with 89% probability. Because it was trained on hundreds of these images, or thousands. And people, of course, love animals, so they have good data sets for that. Now, the, the question always is, do you have good labels, right? If you don't have labels, then you don't know what it is. You just know it's there. There's some structure that looks like a cat, because that's what Google's uh, research paper showed a year, few years ago. They basically trained these models without labels just to learn the structure. And the structure said, well, if I, if I see furry tails, or shapes of cat faces or something, then that's a good feature so that I can memorize that data set. It's a good thing to see cat faces and say, yes, I got one. Because if I can see cat faces, then I can compress the data set uh, with ease, because there's so many cat faces. I just need to know there is one right there and put a yes somewhere, and I got it. right. And that's kind of the idea of these models. It, it learns to see in a way that benefits the, the task. And in this case, the task would be maybe to uh, classify it into the right class. In that Google paper, the, the task was to compress the data set 
and to memorize it as best as possible with as little numbers that they have to store. So one of those numbers basically meant, yes, I saw a cat face. So you can build your own smart applications because anybody literally can now build a model, press a button, deploy it, and then build an application that asks the server and says, hey, what's this, what's this, what's this? And you can just get answers and, and use that to make decisions. So APIs are the future of software. You just publish these capabilities and then put them all together. So this is an outlook for our implementation with CAFE. This is uh, one of the tools that are used for deep learning on, on multi-GPUs. It's really good for image classification. And this is a 16-node cluster that I mentioned. Actually, it's a single node, but there's 16 cards in it. So they have like a special hardware that connects them really efficiently. And NVIDIA wrote some library to make that fast. And we have a prototype that actually runs from Java. It's not quite an H2O, but it will be very soon to run on these 16 GPUs at once, and that's going to be very fast. So the roadmap is to finish the TensorFlow and CAFE integrations. We have prototypes that work in our lab, but uh, for our hands-on today, we'll use the MXNet uh, backend, which was the easiest to integrate because it was written purely in C++, so there's no Python needed to, to run it. And in the future, we'll also add more capabilities. We, we already have capabilities for most of them, but we just have to make templates so that it's easier for you to actually use that and to, to add like scoring metrics for something like an image um, segmentation model. How do you know it's a good segmentation model? Well, you need this overlap coefficient that says how good is the overlap of the actual cancer region and the predicted cancer region, right, divided by the, the union of the two or something. That would be the dice coefficient. For, so we have to add these metrics to make it easier for all these use cases. But the goal is to just bring these, these, these great tools to you in a way that's very easy to consume and to abstract away the technical details of whether it's TensorFlow or MXNet or Cafe in the back end. You just say, I want to do it. And then you can pick one of the different models. Whatever works for you, you download something, you just run it, and we'll worry about the, the technical issues. <coughs> which there are quite a lot of issues, actually, I have to say. It's not easy to compile this stuff and then to run it and to make sure it's all consistent. So today at, uh, at 11, we'll have Dimitri talk about MXNet. We'll have Fabrizio talk about TensorFlow at 2.40. And then at 3 to 4, we have this hands-on workshop. So I really welcome you over there. And we'll see lots of live demos. But on this stage, it's not as easy to do live demos as elsewhere. So we'll skip that for now. But uh, if you have questions, now would be the time. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. So um, I guess I did a little bit of modeling like 10 years ago. So back then, like uh, figuring out which inputs or parameters to apply to the model was was one of the barriers. Like, are you saying now that it's, it's like we can forget that, that we can just dump the, a diverse set of data? Some, some, some of the data is complementary, some of it's not, and the neural network or the AI or deep learner would figure out what's important? Yes, it's, it's very good at figuring out what, what works and what doesn't. It doesn't matter if you have collinear columns and stuff like that, it just, it just figures it out. It's robust enough against these things. However, it is not yet possible to easily create these aggregates, like how many times did the user click on this thing in the last week or something. If you, could, if you have a transaction database where it says, at this time, this user clicked on this thing, right? And then a few uh, minutes or hours later, they clicked, the same user clicked on something else. And then the same user clicked on something else five hours later. That model is not going to say, oh, yeah, I remember this guy. He once clicked this, and now he clicks this. So that means I have three clicks so far in this week for this user. So it's not going to make that aggregate column for you. It could in theory, because this neural net can learn anything. It's like Turing complete, right? But you would have to make a huge model that learns all that. And you would have to have enough data to learn that. So if you have intuition as a data scientist, it's really better for you to put that in and say, oh, yeah, it makes sense to count how many times this happened in the past, put that in as a feature, and then it's going to be much better. So you're not going to win Kaggle with just using deep learning, but you actually will be at least in the top 30 or something percent by just using it, right? It's actually pretty good. All right, thank you.